I love it. Use the parentheses. <laughs> How do you understand the choice to move if you don't understand the choice to stay? Sometimes we say migration. And we want to capture that whole spectrum from displacement to more voluntary forms of migration, but that can be confusing. If you moved to the next neighborhood over, or if you within your city, or if you even moved two streets down, would you call yourself a migrant? Probably not. But that is a form of mobility. You might call that micro mobility. But these are the things too that are affected by climate change and environmental degradation. So mobility captures. This huge range of movement that potentially migration doesn't allow us to to account for. If we start thinking about the logic of why people would choose to move, then it becomes the question of well, why wouldn't you want to move in that case? Migration is just not available to everyone, so moving. Requires money, first of all. You often see that some of the poorest people are those who are, you know, stuck. You also have to know people. So oftentimes, people move to a place because they have connections there. If you're older, right, it's difficult to ask someone in their 70s or 80s to start a new life somewhere else. In my research, I noticed that there are definitely gendered aspects of disasters and gendered aspects of mobility and migration. It is still largely the men who get the opportunity to migrate,、um, mainly because you know they might be seen as better equipped to go to a different country and and be a pioneer and, and survive the difficulties of migration、uh, than women. Uh, and we do know that when it comes to climate change, that women are disproportionately affected. Because they're often less educated, they're、uh, less well off, and there is a lot more burden on them in terms of unpaid labor that they have to do, and they are often not well equipped to deal with disasters. They're not well equipped to mitigate against them or recover、uh, from them. To recognize that while some people would want to migrate, possibly as a way to adapt, there are also many, many people who insist on not migrating. The choice to stay is a difficult one, but there are, it's a choice that many people make. And that's especially the case in small island states, for example, where the island is often considered as a continuation of the self, so is really part of one's identity. It's about the fact that their ancestral graveyards. Are where they are, and if they leave, and if they don't protect it, and they let it wash away, that's their history, that's their traditions gone, and we don't put enough value to those more sentimental, more social, more cultural aspects when we discuss climate change and mobility. The right to stay, I think, is also、uh, an important right to pursue and, and to protect. There's always this push that people want to leave, and we don't talk about the people that want to stay behind,、uh, the people who are more vulnerable because they stay behind, or those who are trapped、uh, and they actually can't go anywhere. A kind of、uh, significant case study is the case of Hurricane Katrina that struck New Orleans about 15 years ago. And about 85 percent of the population of New Orleans did manage to evacuate before the hurricane made landfall. Uh, but the problem was that 15% of them—that's roughly 60,000 people—did not manage to evacuate. And those people who got stranded in the flooded city for about four days and four nights before the relief effort could finally reach them, these people were mostly black and poor. And the reason why those people did not evacuate、uh, are diverse. Some didn't have a car, and there was no evacuation by collective means of transport that was organized. Some were too sick or too old to evacuate. Some didn't know where to go,、uh, and some of them did not have the money to afford to spend a couple of nights in hotels or motels nearby. So we saw really a huge impact of social differences and inequalities in the evacuation patterns. <music> 